I see you. I see you. Welcome back to Philosophy of Religion with this week's topic, How to Talk About God. How to talk about God. Why would it be a problem to begin with? We talk about stuff all the time. I talk about ducks and colors and economic systems and music. I don't ever say, what's the problem of talking about music? I never say, what's the problem of talking about economic systems? And yet some philosophers have said there's a problem when it comes to talking about God. Why? Well, think about the stuff I mentioned last time and the time before that. Divine simplicity. In God there is no this and that, right? Whatever is in God is God, according to the theory of divine simplicity. So if you're at all persuaded by theories of divine simplicity, you're going to have a hard time saying how there can be a statement like God is good, since that implies a this and a that. There's God and there's God's goodness. And yet, according to divine simplicity, those two are exactly the same. They're never, I mean, if I say Kovach is good, I can't say Kovach is goodness. There's a distinction between myself and my properties, like goodness. And what's up with divine eternity? God has no before and after. God has no then and now. But our language, every language, every human language, every conceivable human language, is intrinsically tensed, right? Language has bound up within it a past, a present, and a future. Every verb, every verb has a tense, present tense, past tense, future, future perfect, and so forth. So how can we use these tensed verbs to refer to an atemporal God? These are some of the problems in our language about God section of the course. And language about God is a problem that comes up, it, it always finds its way back into anything you think about in terms of philosophy of religion. Which is why I think this is an important lecture for you to study, because when you turn in your paper, your final paper, um, I might have a criticism of it if I think that you've completely ignored an obvious problem in terms of our language about God. So, let's consider some of the options for language about God. One option and it's an option popular with the theistic personalist. One option is that our language about God is exactly the same as it is anything else. When I say God is good, by good I mean exactly what I mean when I say Kovach is good. After all, says the theistic personalist, God is a person, just like I'm a person, the main difference between the person that is God and the person that is me is that God lacks a body. I'm just going to put my cards on the table. I don't know what a bodiless person is. When I talk about people, I'm talking about things that are bodied. I'm talking about a specific kind of body, the body that is a person. When I say people like eating pizza. What do you mean? I mean, that's a good sentence, it seems to me. People like eating pizza. But to eat something, you have to have a body. If you want to eat something, you need a body to do it. People breathe. You can't breathe if you don't have a body. And so, the theistic personalist, who's um, quite um, certain that God is some sort of person, albeit a bodiless one, will nevertheless not, have no problem saying that the language we use for God is the same as the language we use for any other person. The main difference being, according to somebody, a theistic personalist like Richard Swinburne, the biggest difference being um, that we find our words when it comes to God taking on uh, unusual combinations or unusual magnitudes. Right? I can say that 
I know things, and you know things, and Jimmy Johnsu Bob knows things. And immediately we think, yeah, there's things that I know and things you know, but there's also things I don't know and things you don't know. I don't know what you don't know. But God, of course, when we say God knows, we mean that God knows everything. So now we have an unusual magnitude and an unusual combination of words. It's unusual to say knows everything. But keep in mind, the theistic personalist denies divine simplicity, and they deny the robust theory of divine eternity. They, 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 when they say God is eternal, they mean something like God has no beginning or end. But they certainly think that God exists in time, because after all, people exist in time. Okay, but what if you reject this idea of God being a person without a body? Then what? Well, we do have statements about God. We have statements like God is good, God has knowledge, God loves, right? These are things that traditionally theists say. So what can they possibly mean? What can they possibly mean? I'll walk you through several theories now. Theory number one, it's all negation. It's all disguised negations. To say, and this is popular with um, somebody like Maimonides, a Jewish thinker in the Middle Ages. Um, had a big influence actually on Jewish theology for a while, this theory of disguised negations. To say that God is good on this theory means that God is not wicked. To say that God has knowledge is to say that God is not ignorant, and that's all. To say that God is alive is to say that God is not innate. Okay, I mean, that's a respectable theory, right? It's a respectable theory that attempts to make sense of the statements that we have about God. And yet, it seems to me that one major drawback, namely this, when I say God has knowledge, when I say God has will, I feel like I'm trying to ascribe something positive to God. I'm trying to say something affirmative about God. Right? I'm not merely trying to convey what God is not when I say God has knowledge, or God has will, or God has life, right? I'm not making a, I'm, I'm trying to say something. I'm actually trying to get some affirmative concept into your head when I say these things. Okay, so what else might be going on when I say these things? Well, how else can I make sense of language? Language which is essentially linked to a composite world, essentially linked to a world of this is and that. How can I take a language which is only meant for such a world and apply it to a non this and that reality, a reality known as God? How can I do that? Maybe it's all metaphor. Theory number two. Theory number one was our language is all disguised negations. Theory number two is it's all metaphor. And these are, by the way, the theories that only a, a classical theist has to contend with. If you're a theistic personalist, you've got one theory, namely the theory that language is as ordinary as you'd expect. But if you reject this idea of God as a person without a body, then you're going to need a different theory. Theory number one that you might subscribe to is disguised negations. Theory number two is all metaphor. What is metaphor? Metaphor is this. Metaphor is that I can... Uh, a metaphor... Something is a metaphor when I can uh, literally deny it. Something is a metaphor when um, its negation is something that I can literally accept. Let's do it that way. Metaphor is something whose negation I should literally accept. If I say, your smile is a sunshine for my life. Your smile is a sunshine. Okay, well, what's the negation of that? Your smile is not a sunshine. Right. 
Right. I'm on perfectly good grounds to say, no, your smile is not a sunshine. There's the sunshine. That ain't your smile. What's another example of metaphor? The um, air was hot as fire. The air was hot as fire. I'm in Florida right now. The air is as hot as fire. Well, of course, if that were true, then I would die instantly, right? So if you say, well, the air is not actually as hot as fire. Here's how hot fire is, and the air is only 100 degrees or whatever, Fahrenheit. Well, okay, so I can deny the opposite. Well, okay, so God loves. What's the negation of that? God does not love. Uh-oh, I don't think any traditional believer in God would want to say that God doesn't love, or that God doesn't know, right? Certainly there are, there are metaphorical statements about God, right? If you read the, the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms is just shot through with metaphors about God. God is a fortress. Is God a fortress? No, I mean, uh, fortresses are made of wood or stone or whatever, and God isn't. Right, a fortress is something I can walk in and out of. I can't walk in and out of God. That makes no sense. So the Psalms are shot through with metaphors about God. But is every statement about God to be taken metaphorically? Well, it seems to me, no. I can, I, there are statements about God whose negations I should absolutely be not on board with. Furthermore, there comes the question, what is a metaphor for? What are these statements metaphors for? If something's a metaphor, you have to be able to spell out how the metaphor works. The air is as hot as fire. What do I mean by that? I mean it's really freaking hot! I mean it's unbearably uncomfortable. Your smile is a sunshine. What's the metaphor mean? It means your smile is beautiful. God loves? What's that a metaphor for? How do I, how do I cash it out in literal terms? Eats me. Okay, so there's one theory down, there's two theories down. What other theories might we have for God? We might go the route, if you're, again, we're just talking about classical theism at this point. We might go the route of Dionysius and say only negative statements about God should be made. Don't even bother saying something like God loves. Always make negative statements. Well, this doesn't get us very far. I mean, even though negative theology is going to be very important for a classical theist, at some point you have to say something affirmative about God, it seems. So now I want to give what I think are the two most interesting theories. And if I have some time here at the end, I'll maybe tell you my own theory. It's a paper I'm working on, but here's a couple of interesting theories. Aquinas says, our affirmative statements about God, literally true though they are, are to be taken analogously with our ordinary language. Now it seems to me that Aquinas never really figured out how to cash out what he means by analogy. It seems to me that Aquinas made an observation that a lot of our language just is by way of analogy. We have, it's a, a quirk of our language. Our language is already quirky, and he can point to examples of this quirkiness. Here's his favorite, somewhat scatological, example of analogy in ordinary language. Suppose I say, you're quite healthy. I'm going to focus on this word healthy. I'm going to use it in three different sentences. What do I mean when I say, you're quite healthy? I mean, your body is functioning the way it ought to. Okay, put, keep that, that definition in mind. Your body is functioning the way it ought to. That's what the word healthy means there. And I say, I wonder, do you drink 
green smoothies, they're very healthy, you know. And you say, wait a minute, healthy means your body functions the way it ought to. Green smoothies have bodies that function the way they ought to? No, no. No, no. What I mean is that a green smoothie helps your body function the way it ought to. Okay. So easy. So straightforward. So I've got the word healthy used twice now. I can't just substitute the definition from one into the other, but they're also not totally unrelated. They're not completely off the wall, right? So what's the third kind of sentence here? Suppose you asked me, uh, no, suppose you asked your doctor, how do you know I'm healthy? And your doctor said, well, your urine sample is very healthy. Are you going to grab your urine sample and drink it? After all, a green smoothie is healthy, which is why you drink it. If I say your urine sample is healthy, are you going to grab it and drink it? No. And nor do I mean that your urine sample has a body that functions the way it ought to. However, it does point back to that first instance of healthy, right? Your urine is healthy because it tells me your body is healthy. So Aquinas notices this quirk about human languages, that sometimes we use words in ways that are related, but not quite one-to-one. -one. Words somehow, they, they, they get the same gist going, but not quite on a one-to-one -one relationship. Aquinas calls this relationship, this quirky relationship, I like to just call it quirkiness, Aquinas uh, uses the word analogy for it. Words get used analogously, he says. Okay, all fine and good, except, like I said, it's really hard to spell out the relationships of what's going on when I say God loves and you love, right? What's the relationship? God's not a thing like you. There's a, a the gulf between God and you is uh, vast and infinite, such that it's hard to spell out what the relationship is for saying God loves. So now I'll leave you with a final theory, one that I think is really intriguing, very similar to Aquinas's, by the way, a final theory of God talk. And this has to do with an Australian philosopher called um, Barry Miller. Uh, Barry Miller had been a, um, an engineer until he was 30, and when he, 30, when he turned 30, uh, he quit engineering to become a Catholic priest. Uh, he studied philosophy uh, in the 1950s, was very influenced by Aquinas, but wanted to, to put uh, some of Aquinas' ideas in dialogue with contemporary philosophy. And so he wrote quite a bit about um, philosophy of religion and about divine simplicity. And he noticed that divine simplicity requires some sort of radical rethinking of how we talk about God, right? Because he's in that, he's in that classical theist tradition, he recognizes this need. And to understand Barry Miller's theory of God talk, I have to introduce you to two different concepts. I'm going to write them down here. I'm going to write down two things you need to know. The first concept is what's known as an alienon's adjective. Alienon's adjective. According to Barry Miller, when we say, and he notes, we shouldn't say God knows, we should say God is all-knowing, all-knowing. We shouldn't say God is powerful, we should say God is all-powerful. And according to Miller, all functions as an alien nons adjective. What the heck is an alien nons adjective, you ask? I'll tell you. I'll tell you what an alien nons adjective is. An alien nons adjective is an adjective which reports on the noun that it is attached to in such a way that the noun is no longer of the same kind. Okay, that was complicated. 
Maybe you'll understand better if I give some examples. What kind of duck is a decoy duck? Oh, decoy ducks aren't ducks at all. I can have green ducks and small ducks and big ducks, and those are all kinds of duck. But a decoy duck? A decoy, decoy tells you it's not really a duck at all. Decoy, in that instance, serves as an alien nons adjective. How about carbon footprint? A carbon footprint. A carbon footprint isn't really a footprint, right? Carbon here serves as an alien nons adjective. You see, when you were in school, you learned that adjectives, what did you learn? They, they tell you about the noun. They tell you something about, or you might have even learned it specifies the kind of noun you're talking about. Well, that's all good and fine when you're in grade school, but it completely leaves out of the account alien nouns adjectives. Some adjectives tell you about the noun not by specifying it, not by limiting it, but by telling you it's not that kind of thing at all. It's not that kind of thing at all. Decoy ducks aren't ducks. Counterfeit cash isn't cash. Carbon footprint is not a carbon is not a footprint. If any of you, I, I'm on a text chain with some friends. We're always coming up with ideas for other alien nouns adjectives, and I'm always forgetting some of them. So um, have some fun down in the com box. If you can think of some good alien nouns adjectives, um, put them down there for me. An adjective which modifies the noun in such a way that that noun is no longer that kind of thing at all. Um, that's why at one, at one point we had a list of like over 50 of them, and now I can't... Uh, I used to go back and forth as a... is hot in hot dog, an alien noun's adjective, right? Um, you might say, yes, a hot dog certainly is not a kind of dog. Or you might just say, look, hot dog is just its own term, right? It's just its own word. It's not, a, it's not an adjective and a noun at all. I'm more inclined to that latter view. But see what you can come up with. Put them down there in the comment boxes for me. Okay. So Barry Miller wants to say that when it comes to God, all serves as an alien nons adjective. God's all-powerfulness is not actually an instance of power. God's all-lovingness is not actually an instance of lovingness. Well, then what is it? What is it an instance of? And here's where the second thing, the second concept comes in for Barry Miller. He's going to say, the attributes that we ascribe to God are, in fact, limit cases are called limit cases. What is a limit case? A limit case is when you have an instance of something, it's when you have a, a spectrum, you have a spectrum that terminates in something that's not actually an instance of what the spectrum is a spectrum of. Sounds complicated. Again, let's see if some examples will do something for you. Consider Velocity. Velocity. You know, speed. Um, the scientists tell us there is a limit simpliciter, a limit full stop of velocity, the speed of light. 326,000 miles per second, I think. Right? You can't have a velocity faster than that. It's impossible. That's the limit simpliciter. Not the limit case, the limit simpliciter, the simplified, the simple limit full stop of velocity. So what's the limit case of velocity? Zero miles per hour. But you say, you complain, but zero miles per hour, that's not speed at all. That's, that's just being at rest. Oh. Yeah. You're right, but as you go down the, down the spectrum of velocities, you get slower and slower and slower, and eventually you terminate, you terminate the spectrum terminates, I mean, there's no word spectrum, I feel like there's another word I'm looking for there. You go down 
the line of velocity is getting slower and slower and slower until you terminate in something that's not actually velocity at all, zero miles per hour. You want another example? I'll give you another example. Angled polygons. Well, here's the limit simpliciter of angled polygons, the triangle, right? You cannot have an, a polygon with fewer sides than a triangle. Well, let's see how that spectrum goes. You have triangles, then what? Squares and rectangles, and then um, uh, pentagons, hexagons, septagons, octagons, right? Keep going, you yeah. know, 18-sided figure, 24-sided figure. Where's, where's this line going to end? Oh, it's going to end in something that doesn't have lines at all, the circle. The circle is the limit case of angled polygons. So a limit case is when you have a, a spectrum that terminates in a limit case where that limit case is not actually an instance of what the spectrum is a spectrum of. The spectrum of angled, why do I feel like I'm using the word spectrum wrong? God, this is so embarrassing because I'm on video. I'm on video. One of you at home are probably thinking, no, I know which word you're thinking of. You're thinking of Anyways, the line of the line of lined angled polygons starts with triangle. It keeps going and going and going and going. And where does it end? Something that's not a lined polygon at all, a circle. So a circle is a limit case here. So Barry Miller proposes that to say that God is all powerful is not an instance of power, it's a limit case of power. Notice you can kind of you can kind of discern the relationship between a circle and everything that comes before it. You can kind of see that relationship. You can kind of see the relationship between zero miles per hour and every kind of velocity. So God's all power has that kind of relationship. It's related to power without actually being an instance of power. So that's Barry Miller's theory of God talk. I think it's very fascinating. Um, I have my own theory of God talk. I won't go into it today. If you ask me about it, maybe I'll put something down in the comment boxes for you. But um, I hope you're all well. Uh, we'll have a couple more lectures yet this semester. I want to talk about um, I want to talk about the problem of evil. I want to talk about um, life after death. If we have a chance, I'd like to talk about religion and morality. I might also like to talk about um, the question of miracles. So there'll be a few more lectures here over the next couple of weeks. Um, final paper is due May 4th. Um, let me know if you have questions about that. No more than 1,200 words, please, for your final paper. Um, and if you want help coming up with a prompt, let me know. Um, I think I've, I may have sent out a couple of prompts already, but any topic really from the philosophy of religion textbook will do. Um, all right, see you next time.